Uh, let me just, uh, just a little bit of a review from last week for those of you that were here. I started teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians last week. It's a letter that, that the Apostle Paul writes to uh, a church that he started uh, in the city of Corinth. So there's two letters that we have, so we call one 1 Corinthians, the other one 2 Corinthians. And uh, I just gave kind of an introduction to the whole thing, an introduction to a bit of historical back background and also uh, just some of the things that, that we're dealing with in that letter. Um, let me just, if I could just summarize last week, it's the faithfulness of God, <laughs> okay? Uh, just in those, that little part that we looked at last week, uh, we just see how, you know, here's this church, talk about problems in this church, <laughs> And yet, he continues to talk to them as children of God, as a church, um, and we, we just describe the faithfulness of God. So I'm not going to say too much more about that, but very encouraging. So today, uh, what I want to talk about grows out of another part of, of uh, that letter. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate it this way. A little bit of a story, a little bit of history for our own church here, and I think it serves as a, as a good story for what I'm going to be talking about. Thirteen and a half years ago, uh, we as a church were located in a different building. I don't know how many of you were there. That, how many of you were in our previous building? Okay, a good chunk of you. Um, and um, the space presently is occupied by those of you that weren't there, pipsqueaks and damsels, above rooms to go. That's where we were for uh, just over 14 years. Uh, that space had served us well at that point. Um, we had outgrown the space. We became aware of this building. I actually came in here to buy furniture one day, <laughs> and I knew the, the owner of it, Joe Condola, and, and we'd known each other for a while, and, and uh, he goes, hey, Hart, still looking for a bigger building? I said, yeah, we're always looking, you know. He goes, well, what about this one? I said, ah, no, I don't think it can work, you know. Um, and anyways, long and short, um, we, we started exploring and went, you know what? I, I think this is where we should be, you know. Um, and um, um, we presented the whole idea to those of you that were there at that point, the church. Um, and it was going to cost us about a quarter of a million dollars to do the renovations on here, about $250,000, with a whole lot of volunteer work. And so we talked about all the details we could, we could talk about and know at that point and presented that to all of you that were there. And... Uh, said, well, let's go home and pray on this thing, and then we're going to come back together, and let's find out what you all feel God's saying to us. Um, and so we got back together, and we, we heard discussion from different people and questions and that kind of stuff. And typically, we don't, as a church, vote. You know, we, we don't believe, we don't do decisions by majority, <laughs> We try to do decisions as a church. What do we believe God's calling us to do? So we try to find that out in different ways. And so as we had talked, I, I said to the church at that point, I said, okay, I know we don't vote, but I need to know from you how many of you think this is what we should be doing. This is what God's telling us to do at this point. 100% of the people present said, yes, we should do this. <laughs> Um, and so we got possession of this building, January 1st, uh, 2003, uh, and we dedicated the two months of January and February to doing all the renos in this building. It was a lot of work, uh, and, I, and I asked everyone, give us a weekend, give us a Friday and a Saturday. A whole bunch of you gave a whole lot more than that, okay? But I said, can, can you all give us at least a Friday and a Saturday during these two months? And so the first weekend, we said it was demolition. There was a floor that went right through this whole built, this room, okay? There was a big stairwell that went up in the middle of this, this room. There, were wash, there was washroom back here, offices right in our main room here. The back was just a loading dock. This was completely empty all the way through to the front door, okay? So first, first weekend, demolition. We had about 30, 40 of us here, <laughs> ripping and tearing, okay? Second weekend, framing. Third weekend, electrical and uh, plumbing stuff. Fourth weekend, we just kept going going like that. And you know what? It worked. That's the amazing thing. It actually worked. And we're talking 95% volunteer labor doing this thing. And you know, you know what else is amazing? All the money came in. 
we're talking a quarter million dollars from you and all the people that were part of that church at that point. Um, all this money came in to cover all the costs to do the renovations on this building. And um, March 1st, or sorry, the first Sunday uh, in March, uh, we were in this space um, and uh, started our first service here. Uh, you know, here's the other thing. I don't think I heard a single dissenting voice during that whole period, during that whole thing. There was, there was no, ah, how come we're doing this? I didn't hear a single voice like that during that whole time. And so I'm not saying we're a church that does it all right, but I am saying that was the grace of God for us to be able to do it that way. And, and I'd like to use that as an example of the power of people united with a common goal. Uh, the whole thing of unity, the whole thing of being together um, and, and saying this is where we're going, this is what we're doing, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, conversely, I've heard of building projects by groups of people that have been stalled for years. <laughs> and even when they do happen, there's all kinds of dissension in the process. And um, that's, that's the opposite example. Uh, and so I want to talk about this whole thing uh, today. Um, what we experienced is a picture of how Jesus wants his church to function. Uh, and so I'd like to today talk about the power of the church that is one. Um, and so first of all, uh, I'm going I'm to get into 1 Corinthians in just a bit. But um, let, me, let me say first of all, Jesus had a huge priority for oneness among his followers. This was extremely important to him. I'll just read you a couple of verses out of uh, John chapter 17, which is a prayer uh, that, that Jesus prayed. Uh, John 17, 21 to 23, says, I pray that all of them may be one, Father. Praying to the Father. Praying for all of us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So one of the greatest desires that Jesus has for any of you that are followers of Jesus, one of the greatest desires he has for us is that there is this real dynamic sense of oneness, of unity, of togetherness among us as followers of Jesus. Jesus is totally committed to the church to this thing that he called the church, which is his people gathered, his people coming together, just like we are all over the city this morning, okay? There's various churches, and we see ourselves as part of the larger church in this community. The Bible, in fact, says that Jesus died for the church. <laughs> Sometimes people try to minimize this whole thing of the church. Uh, Jesus said he died for the church, and his prayer is, that we would be one. Now, Jesus, of course, knew the power of unity in and of itself, okay? Just, a, just unity, period. Many of you are familiar with the story um, in the Old Testament of the Tower of Babel. Can't get into all the details for the sake of time here this morning, but Genesis eleven six 6 says, The Lord said, If as one people, okay, they all came together to build this huge tower. If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now, there were wrong motives, which we can't, get all, can't all get into here this morning. But he's talking about the power of unity, the power of togetherness. When a group of people all together say, we're going to do this together, <laughs> we have one common goal. Uh, another example is the early church. One of the, one of the, 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 the things that gave, gave great effectiveness to the early church right after Jesus actually left the earth, not the only thing, but one of the things is their unity. Here's a negative example 
um, from the book of Proverbs. And um, I'll, I'll explain this briefly. Let me read it first. Um, so from a, from a negative perspective, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And then he names five other ones, and I'm, I just left those out. Uh, a false witness who pours out lies and a man who sit, stirs up dissension among brothers. So he does this a number of times in Proverbs. You go, oh, if you're going to say seven, why don't you just say seven? You know, six, no seven. You know, a bunch of times in Proverbs. You know, there's five, no six. You know, um, it's a literary device to emphasize the last one. Okay, so in this case, he says, you know what? There's six things that God really doesn't like, but you know what? Here's the one he really doesn't like. <laughs> and it's the last one, and that is a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. So, talking about this whole thing of, of unity, uh, let me say, unity is not normative in our culture. <laughs> We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here, but in, in Corinthians, in the passage we're going to look at, there's a real lack of unity in this church, okay? There's all kinds of garbage going on in this church. <laughs> and um, one of the things he says to them at one point, he says, you know what, aren't you guys just acting like mere men? In other words, aren't you just functioning the same way everybody else functions around you? I have a higher expectation of you. We could, we could think of all kinds of examples in terms of our culture. Now, certainly there are examples of people functioning in oneness, but my, my point is there's so many examples around us to the contrary. Uh, we could think of our government in terms of how we function um, with, with the official opposition party. It seems, at least to me, that there's no effort to govern our country as a unified body of elected officials. Now, I understand uh, we're, we're governed by a democracy, but what if all of our elected officials said, we together, all of us, whether we're the elected party or not, we all together are going to try to understand each other and hear each other. We're all going to go towards a common goal. We're, we'll disagree, but we'll learn to disagree in a way that is, is beneficial and helpful. What if that happened? <laughs> I think of in our city, if a decision is made and various people disagree, the, the, the response to that often is to try to gather people and, <laughs> we don't agree with this. <laughs> and we could, of course, give all kinds of examples of that. Um, I, for the most part, quit reading our letters to the editor because I just don't like the, uh, that goes on in there. <laughs> um, even in the workplace, we're tempted at least at various points, if I want something, I will just go for it without thinking so much about how do I have beneficial relationships with everybody around me. And then we got the church made up of a whole pile of different kinds of people. <laughs> Look around you. We got, you know, a vast array of economic backgrounds or, or situations, perhaps is a better word. Uh, we got different races. We got all different kinds of people. And God calls us to function together in unity, in oneness. So, where do I think we're at? Well, I have the privilege of having pastored this church for almost 30 years. And I can think of times as a church where I would say we're not experiencing a lot of unity right now. <laughs> and you know what? Those times are not fun. They are difficult. And there's <laughs> and I've, I've had a few of those times in the in the history of this church, and some of you have been there during those times as well. Where do I believe we're at now? I believe that as a local church, we are experiencing a unity that as, as, as much as we have ever experienced as a church. And there's a real sense of us working together, hey, 
we, we got common purposes, common goals. We know where we want to go, and there's a sense of, hey, we really want to do this together. <clears throat> the thing I find so encouraging is I would say the same thing about the church at large in this community. I would say that there is as much unity as or more unity within the larger church in Penticton and surrounding area than I've ever experienced. And I think, Ron, you would agree, right? Ron's part of our, our pastors that get together regularly. And, um, you know, so what, what do I believe God would say to us? I believe he would say to us, Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he goes through the following verses. He talks about, because we're one body. There's only one Spirit. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. So the thing is, focus on the things that we have in common. But the thing I believe God would say to us today, you guys, you know what? We're all human. The enemy wants to get in. What does he want to do? Divide and conquer, right? Divide and conquer. And so his instruction to us is make every effort to maintain, to keep the unity of the Spirit. So having said that, let's jump into where the Corinthian church was at a little bit, okay? Um, I just want to read uh, some of the passages there. Um, first of all, starting 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17. <clears throat> so it's part of Paul's letter to this church. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me, okay, some people came, talked to him, informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, oh, no, I don't follow Paul. I follow Paulus. Another, I follow Cephas, who is Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? All of you that were baptizing today, we're not baptizing you into the name of Hart, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> we're baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Okay? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say they were baptized into my name. <laughs> yes, I, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, he says. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. I'm glad he didn't know for sure. Was there somebody else I baptized? Makes me feel good. He wasn't quite sure who we all baptized. <laughs> for Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Jumping over to chapter 3, because it carries on to the same topic, just verses 1 to 4 at this point. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? So let's just pull this apart a little bit just so we understand this. Um, so first of all, one of the things that's very clear here is they had quarrels going on in the church. Let me just talk about their situation a little bit here. We know that uh, there's verse, chapter 1, verse 11 says that. Uh, chapter 3, verse 3 talks about jealousy and quarrels going on. They were using what they perceived to be one of the leaders' way of teaching. Okay, Paul says this, Apollo says this, you know, Peter says this. They were using that to kind of pit one against the other. That was not the leader's intention, but that's what they were saying. And so one was saying, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Paulus, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. Paul was the founder of the church. Apollos was one of these guys who was really charismatic. Okay, we know that from the things that are told us. Uh, he, he, um, he was very eloquent when he spoke. Uh, Peter had been there already in the church. He'd come to visit the church of Corinth already. 
And so very likely, because Peter was a Jew, probably the Jews within the church were going, oh, no, we're siding with him, okay? And then there was the super spiritual people. We don't side with any people. We just side with Christ, <laughs> okay? Um, and so we, we recognize that there's this ongoing tension that they, pers that they made up in terms of the various leaders within the church. And we already mentioned this briefly, they put special weight on who baptized them. Well, I was baptized by him, man. <laughs> and it's not something Paul wanted. In fact, he was glad to have others baptize people. And he's certainly not negating the importance of baptism, which we're doing here this morning. Um, little side note, interesting that Paul went to this community, started proclaiming the good news of Jesus, People became believers. We read very early on that many became believers, but Paul says, well, I only baptize these few people. <laughs> In other words, he very quickly got other people doing this stuff. He wasn't just doing it all himself. And today I'm actually baptizing three of the four. Um, usually I try to get various other leaders baptizing people, and it's something that Paul modeled, that Jesus himself modeled. Uh, in terms of getting others to do that. And so the things that I believe God would say to us today, like I already alluded to, is this whole thing of, for us, fight for unity. Be about the things that matter most to Jesus. Division, whether it's between relationships, whether it's within a church, whether it's within a family, divisions usually happen through someone emphasizing the non-essentials, getting all wrapped up about things that really don't matter. Titus chapter 3, verse 9 is written within the context of divisiveness. He says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies, which are really important to them. Avoid arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Secondly, in terms of fighting for unity, I'd like to say fight against those things that contribute to division. And, and like I already said, this can apply to our own life, to, to relationships that you have for, with different people. Learn to disagree in a way that is healthy. <laughs> One thing we do know is in any healthy relationships, there are disagreements at various points. But it's how we disagree that makes all the difference. Within a church context, within relationships that you have, learn to disagree in a way that really values the other person. Here's a great example of, um, I remember the, uh, the founder of our movement of, of Vineyard Churches, uh, John Wimber, uh, shared the story at one point in terms of majoring on the things that really matter. Um, he had a large church um, and a lot of small groups, a lot of home groups within the church. And one of the uh, small groups was being led by a fellow who had been a Lutheran pastor before. And uh, as a Lutheran pastor, he, he had practiced infant baptism, okay, as soon as a child was born, baptized them. And... Um, the, the people in a small group said to him at one point, well, why don't you teach us about this stuff, you know? Knowing that as a church, they believed in believers' baptism as we are practicing today. And so he came to John Wimber and said, what do I do? You know, I don't, you know, you know what, what I believe as a Lutheran pastor. You've, you've said I can go ahead and lead a group. And here was, here was John's response to him. Go ahead and explain to them why you believe what you believe. But don't cause division or else I'll come down real hard on you. <laughs> See, there's a big difference between the two. Nothing wrong with talking about varying understandings, varying opinions. The church is a whole lot bigger than that. His whole thing was don't cause division. And so there's ways we can disagree that value the other person, that continue to honor the other person. <clears throat> and so... Um, fight against 
um, those things that contribute to division in your own life, but also in those around you. Here's, here's the, the tenth verse of one I just read up in Titus 3.9 there. He says, Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Whoa, talk about strong language. It's probably the strongest language in Scripture of if someone's just creating division among people, hey, you know what? You're best off just staying away from a person like that if that's what they're going to create. Okay, in terms of uh, fighting for unity, bless the variety of gifting among leaders. Let me just read uh, verses 5 and 6 in chapter 3. Paul says, what after, what after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. The beauty of a church is its diversity. All different leaders, all different kinds of people. But the temptation often among us to say, well, how come, how come Lauren leads different than Allison and you know, how come Gazim is different than that? Isn't, isn't the diversity beautiful? That's what the body of Christ is. All different kinds of people valuing the, the, the different ways that God has made us. Another point in terms of uh, fighting for unity is build carefully. Use the right materials. <laughs> Um, and I, I think he's talking especially to leaders here, but there's certainly application to all of us. Listen to what he says. He uses the, a building analogy, okay, when he talks about this. So chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. For by the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation. Okay, he's the one who started the church. Okay, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If, anyone, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, not the kind of building materials we would think of using, okay, but uh, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light, the day when Jesus comes back. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. What's he talking about? He's talking about this whole thing of building in a way that brings unity. And he says, if we are building in a way that tears down, he says, your work's going to be, there's going to be nothing left when Jesus comes back. You may be a believer and a follower of Jesus, and you're going to get in, <laughs> okay, so to speak. But he says, build using the right materials. Build using materials that can be tested with fire. Here's an analogy that I've given to leaders at different times. Um, you know, within any group of people, there's going to be little fires that crop up at different times. going to be somebody disgruntled. Somebody's going to come to one of you and say, I can't, that Ron Crooker guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what I've said to leaders is every time there's a little fire that crops up, somebody says something negative, something that's tearing down rather than building up, you've got a can of gas in one hand and you've got a can of fire in the other. Sorry, what did I say? Fire. In the, no, I'm just kidding. Gas, water, okay? You have the potential whenever there's a little fire cropping up of either putting the fire out or making it burn more. You can do something with gossip that will just whoo, fuel it, or you can kill it at that point. And, and that's a great example, I think, of this whole thing of being careful how we build, being careful what we do to make sure that it contributes to unity. Do you want to get crazy? 
Another thing here in terms of fighting for unity is we, the church, here's an interesting, this is really interesting. We, all of us here, if you're a follower of Jesus, we are God's temple. Make sure you're building it up, not tearing it down. And, and here's the reason why. Listen to what he says. 3, 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves, okay, he's talking plural now. You yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. God feels really protective of his temple. <laughs> okay? You destroy God's temple, you better watch yourself. You got something coming. <laughs> It's, you know, maybe another analogy we could use is, is uh, as the church, we're also called the bride of Christ. You ever want to get in trouble with a groom on his wedding day, say something real negative about his bride, <laughs> okay? Same thing here with Jesus in terms of the temple. He says, you destroy the temple. I don't, you know, the temple is sacred. We are sacred in God's eyes. God values this thing of the church very highly, and, and he's very protective of it. And so he calls us continually to, to uh, um, be people that do everything we can to build it up. I always, I, I don't know if this will work or not, my analogy. Um, growing up uh, in a church, uh, not in a church, but my, we went, we were part of a church, okay, <laughs> Didn't grow up in a church. Um, uh, the the board meetings or or council meetings in German were called Gemeinderat. Okay, um, and I used to change that a little bit because uh, I, I viewed it negatively just from my own vantage point, and I used to call it Gemeindegebratung. You know, which Gemeinderat is is you know church council meeting. The other means church burning, okay? Well, when my mom heard me say that once, she had a very strong rebuke for me, <laughs> okay? And I still remember that. This is a lot of years later. I was like, whoa, I, I didn't see fire in my mom's eyes too often, but I saw some there. I was like, don't you dare speak that way about the church, you know? And, and I, I think that's what he's talking about here. A couple other things, real briefly, um, in terms of fighting for unity, don't think too much of yourself. <laughs> Verse 18 in chapter 3, do not deceive yourselves. If anyone thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. In other words, what he's saying here is don't think too much of yourself. Don't think too highly. Don't think you've got all the right answers all the time. Humility goes a long ways in terms of harmonious relationships. Being willing to hear, being willing to listen, being willing to pay attention to what others have to say. And just a few practical things that I just thought of. Don't take on an adversarial role to each other. Nope. You know what? Your brother's never your enemy. Your brother is never your enemy. Your brother's your brother. Your brothers in other churches are your brothers. As a leader, be a learner. Know how to listen to input from others. Be for each other. Recognize, you know what, it's one thing I really value with other pastors in this community is this whole thing of, you know what, we're on the same team. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Cheer each other on. And last, or second last, speak well of each other. And then lastly, bless people that are different than you. So, um, in a, just to wrap up here, we're talking about this whole thing of uh, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. That applies with us here. It applies in relationships. It applies in families. It applies in marriages. Um, 
And if you've been married for a long time, you realize sometimes your relationship can spin down like this, and you go, how did we get here? <laughs> okay? And so a lot of these things we're talking about here in terms of how do we have unity instead of disunity, disharmony, um, conflict, uh, negative conflict. So, so we're going to, anybody want to do this? Anybody want to do this? A few more? We got 10, 20, 30. Okay, let me just pray. Father, thank you that, that where there is unity among brothers and sisters, you command a blessing there. That's what you can bless. And so, Lord, I pray for your hand of protection over this church, over your larger church in this community and area. I pray that we would be people that demonstrate um, valuing each other, cheering each other on, blessing each other, being for each other, working toward the common goal of continuing to spread the good news to those around us. And Lord, as we move into the baptism now, Lord, I, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to so uh, come and fill each of these four that are being baptized this morning. Pray for you to empower them uh, in an even greater way from this day forward to walk your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say one more thing. Um, just before we do the baptism, because I just realized some of you have come here today because your friends have invited you to the baptism, and you might go, well, what is this all about? We're going to be baptizing each of them down into the water. We're going to be putting them down in the water and back up. Um, the Bible talks about that as, as symbolic of what happened to Jesus. When Jesus actually died, he was crucified. Where he actually died, he was dead for three days, and then he rose back to life. When we become a follower of Jesus, we're identifying with that. We're identifying with what Jesus did for us. And, and so we're dying to living life our way, and we're saying, I'm coming up to live life God's way, okay? So that's what the baptism is signifying today. And it's something that God commands us to do when we become a follower of Jesus. Do this in front of a group of people to say, I'm going for Jesus. So that's what we're going to do. Um, after the baptism, what we're going to do is the people will come, the four of them will come up, and we're going to pray for them. So... I want to encourage different ones of you to come up and pray for them. And we pray for God's Holy Spirit to come and fill them and empower them. Okay? We can't live this life ourselves. We need God to empower us. And so we ask you to come around them and pray for them at that point. So at this point, I'm going to have the worship team come up and do a song. Uh, some of us are going to get changed. And if somebody can be calling the kids down, um, then uh, we'll go ahead with baptism. So worship team, come on up and lead us in a song here.